Uh, this, uh, we're going to talk about an international snack food manufacturer. Since we're all friends here, it's Frito-Lay. Uh, I used to work at Frito um, several years ago. I don't know if there's anybody from PepsiCo here. But um, so this is a, um, a well-executed, I guess, red ocean strategy. And Frito-Lay at the time was the, and still is today, was the dominant player in the snack food industry, had over 50% market share, had operating margins in excess of 20%, and was totally dominant. Um, however, inside the organization, we're looking at, you know, our real growth is slowing. We're only growing 1% or 2% a year. Um, we're a company that constantly reflected on where we're at, looking at how are we doing, benchmarking ourselves. And um, we came to the conclusion that the price value relationship to the customer had dropped. Uh, two consequences. One is that we became a price umbrella to our competitors, letting them to uh, gently or not so gently encroach on our, on our business. And um, second, it was slowing down the growth. So the reaction of the company to it, and I really give credit to the management team, is that they had the will to make some fairly dramatic changes to a very successful company when they didn't have to. Um, it's always easier, as Arnie said, to operate in a crisis, but we were not in crisis. We were doing extremely well. And uh, so we took about 1,000 people out of our organization, a couple hundred million dollars in costs out of our structure, um, we set our plan, which was quite radical at the time, is to freeze our pricing for five years. So to take no price increases for five years. Um, because of our size, we were concerned about Department of Justice issues and anti-competitive pricing or predatory pricing. So we, and obviously we did not announce it to the world, so we froze our prices. And we still were targeting 15% growth a year, a very ambitious target. So we took the hundred, couple hundred million dollars in savings, plowed it back into marketing spending to uh, focus more on the consumer. We kind of lost our way and we were spending money on trade promotions rather than doing advertising and developing new products. And then we set a very tough schedule or plan for ourselves to cut 5% in real dollars out of our cost structure every single year. And we did it on a line item by line item basis, manufacturing overhead, logistics, sales, G&A. And um, the punchline was that we were able to meet our financial targets and also reignite growth in the category. And um, the uh, growth got up to double digits. And um, it was a real success story. So in my personal experience, that was the most disciplined approach that I've seen to tackling a, an issue that faced the company when there was not a crisis on. Frito could have well um, just continued on its way. And I remember there was skepticism on the street at the time when we did this. They were asking, like, what's really going on? You know, why are you cutting so many heads? You're making, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. You got the best margins in the uh, consumer products business. And they frankly didn't believe us for a while until we started producing the, the results. So that is a good story. And the next one, um, is a contrast. <laughs> this is an end of, uh, end of life story. And uh, this is RG Steel. It's a live case. Um, we bought the assets at Sparrows Point, out just outside of uh, Baltimore, right after Labor Day this year. This is the old Bethlehem Steel plant that was built in the 1890s. This plant made the uh, steel for the Golden Gate Bridge, built a lot of um, uh, ships that were fought in World War II, so really an uh, iconic facility. At its peak, it had 30,000 employees. It's on 3,400 acres. Uh, so I thought I'd do is just take you through just one investment decision when we got on site. We were responsible for selling the assets, so we got deep into the assets to see what they're worth. Um, we were told that uh, they had a state-of-the-art coal rolling mill, and I won't bore you with all the details of steel making, that cost $350 million. It was built in the year 2000. But in this investment decision, you can kind of see how internally focused they were, as opposed to, as Steve pointed out, when um, he took over General Motors, looking at the wider world. So they spent $350 million to build this mill, and it was flawed. Um, they justified it internally, because I asked them, how did you justify it? By saving $40 a ton by building it, which translates to $50 million a year or so. 
but as we got into it, they left more than $100 a ton on the table by not making the right decision at the time, um, which would have saved them another 100 to $150 million a year, added up over the 10 or 12 years, it's $1.5 billion that they let go out the door. What they did do is they had an unbalanced mill. When they spec that new mill out, um, they had existing facilities on the property. So their finishing capacity did not match the rolling capacity. It was out of balance. They only had 30% finishing capacity. So they had to actually take 70% of the product coming out of this cold mill and ship it quarter mile, half a mile to three other facilities on the site. Uh, in hindsight, what they should have done is put it all in one place and they could have eliminated those three other facilities. And I'm not quite sure how many employees there were there, but somewhere between three to 500 employees in those other facilities, plus all the logistics, handling, and inventory issues, and put them in one location. And um, they could have saved a lot of money. So piecing it together, looking back, what they were unwilling to do is look externally of what's going on in the marketplace. They did not want to face the tough decisions of how to deal with the manning issues and, and their labor issues. And they actually limited, limited their product scope. The mill that they bought was 60 inches wide. Their finishing capacity was 48 inches wide. So they could only roll 48 inch wide steel in a 60 inch mill, uh, which made no sense at all. You lost 20% of your capacity right off, right off the chute. So um, this is a case where you had a company that was totally insular. They're focused on their own costs. Um, when Steve was talking about the decision about building a new engine, this is kind of the same thing. They spent 350, if they spent 400 and 450, they could have uh, put themselves in, in much better much better shape. Um, th this is just a picture of the site. It is, it is massive. It's 3,400 acres, which is just huge. Um, a leading edge story. Cooper Tire, as you may know, is the uh, fourth largest tire manufacturer in North America. Um, we worked on a project with them in 2011. Uh, they had made a decision to close their Albany, Georgia tire plant um, in the 2009-2010 time, time frame. If I can do an advertisement for Hilco, what we did was we came in with a total solution for them. It was a two, two million square foot manufacturing facility. As Arnie said, we can invest capital. So we actually paid them for the right to take care of their facility. So what we did was we demolished the facility. We did the environmental remediation. And um, we subsequently um, built a distribution center there, which they are leasing from us. And um, th this was a decision that was, um, this is before and after. Um, so what they did was they made a conscious decision to take capacity out of their system in advance of needing to. And what made this even more pertinent was that um, during this time frame, the government actually put a 30% import tariff on tires. So they could have reversed field because they had an opportunity where now they, all of a sudden they had a 30% shield to protect that plant. But they had already made the decision that they had too much capacity in North America and they went ahead with their decision. So I, I use this as another example of a company proactively dealing with their cost structure, thinking longer term. That tariff just expired um, this past year, and before, I, before we got here, I, I looked up what their latest financial results are. So right now, they're trading close to their 52-week high at $26 a share, and they're also um, quadrupled their profits from the prior year um, for the last nine months, so a very successful story. John, why don't you wind it up first? Oh, I thought you were going to wind up. Okay. <laughs> I okay. control the flicker. All right, the, uh, so the takeaways are, um, we call it kill complacency. I mean, you have to have a sense of urgency about what you're doing. Um, you can't lose touch with your business and your marketplace. You gotta build it into your culture that you gotta address these issues day in and day out. Um, understanding your culture, you gotta support it. If it's out of whack, you gotta fix it. As uh, John Cow talked about yesterday, you have to practice. You can't just have the sheet music. You've got to practice. It's a Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours, except you've got to do it on a corporate basis. And then once you have all those in place, 
you have to ensure the culture and your organization are in, in harmony. You got to look. You got to look forward, and frankly, you need good leaders um, that have the will to make the tough, tough decisions and face reality. So, that's our conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you.